of unknown of unknown until the flowers emerge red hibiscus like large enough to contain the whole sunset syrupy sky you have to find that island make it float in your mouth all right so weird on zoom how it's like a dead quiet <laughs> audience I think we're, one. Just, we're just enjoying them. They're so beautifully, <laughs> Good. beautifully written. We can just Thank you so much. Visualize it. So the next poem um, is going to go forward in time to 1912. And on another trip that Jack and Charmian took, where they left, in, they left Baltimore and went around Cape Horn to Seattle um, on a ship called the Dirigo. Um, and, and Charmian wrote a great deal about this journey. It was right before... Um, they were dreaming about building Wolf House, which was the mansion they were building that would burn down before they moved in. And um, she was, you know, she had lost her first child um, after a, a terrible uh, birth experience. And then um, she didn't know that she couldn't, she couldn't carry a child to term anymore. So she was still trying to conceive. And so on this trip, she becomes pregnant with a child that she loses shortly after returning. So for her, this was this, she wrote her first short story on the ship um, and she and Jack um, collaborated on writing the Valley of the Moon on the ship as well. Um, and, and it was this amazing moment of creation for them aboard the Jericho. But it was a place where she realized how unequal the relationship was. So this is called On Seeing the Red Bird Off the Coast of Argentina Aboard the Jericho 1912. In the times between and the time after, the air moved like a pompero, cold breath color coloring, cold breath covering everything. They shortened sails, readied for whatever futures might blow in. First were the mosquitoes, those small machines of fury clouding their heads, no room free of them. Then the wasps came war of sickle and sting. They took shelter below deck, but couldn't parry their assault. Pale moon gasping on water. That's why when the red Arch Argentinian bird appeared, no one had words to speak relief, or there must be land close by, or after the squall opens the powdery resolution of stars. Beautiful. You can just visualize that. Thank you. Visualize that when the red bird came. Was it actually a red bird? Is the or does it the was. Red stamp? Yeah, the they recorded it. It's how they knew they were near land. Is there were actually birds again? So when you're at sea, whatever comes onto your boat tells you kind of where you are. So as I got closer and closer to land bigger and, and bigger animals, you know, or, you know, would come onto, or insects and then animals. So the next poem I'm gonna read is about the photograph that um, inspired this book. Um, I'm gonna try to share. Um, you guys see that? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, let me put it into slideshow mode. So this photograph um, is one of the most famous photographs of Jack London. Um, and it's of um, him on Sonoma Mountain, um, looking out over the Valley of the Moon. And um, when I was writing my uh, third poetry, my second poetry book, um, There's a Ghost in This Machine of Air, I was the poet laureate of Sonoma County in Northern California. And um, I was researching the grandfather of the Gravenstein apple, um, and he uh, had three daughters. Um, and one of um, all three of them were college educated in the late 1800s. So that was very unusual. Um, and one of them was a poet. So of course I looked into her and got her book, Our Valley of the Moon in Poems and Pictures. And what I saw when I opened it was this picture of Jack London, this famous photograph that's on the trash cans at the park. It's on all the famous biographies about Jack London. And it was attributed to Charmian. And I thought, 
oh, I didn't know she took that picture. And I immediately reached out to Jack London scholar, scholars and I said, hey, did you guys know that Charmian took this photograph? And um, they were like, no, we never really thought to ask that question. And so this poem, um, and so that led me on the next six years of my life researching Charmian's life so that we could see what else we had not really bothered to ask about her life and about her life with Jack. And so this poem is about that picture. It's called Sailor on Horseback. A window can be clear or freckled with air, can be leaded with the set metal of an accepted history. In the photo, he's seated on his horse, set against scalloped golden hills over a brail of valley farms. The foreground, a sea of untamed grass. Here, it will always be spring. A day before the first Japanese lanterns will, will open their blooms of seed to chance winds. A day before oily poppies will punctuate everything in exclamations. A day before fog will threaten to shorten the distance. On that day, there was no one behind to record Charmian's eye looking into the lens of her camera to capture his portrait. Let us set the record straight. It's beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful. That was a long journey, six six years to discover yeah. how important Charmian was. That's about yeah. how long it takes to write a biography, um, especially about a woman that's been forgotten, because you have to you have to you know really hunt around for the for the answers because they're not in obvious places. Um, I'm gonna come back to that poem, but I want to show you this photograph. Um, this is by Hansel Meath, the famous photograph. Um, uh, she's a she was she she was the second woman to work at Time Life magazine as a photographer, um, and she's a, an amazing photographer. And she and her husband Otto went to visit Charmian after Jack had died many years after in the 1940s, and they took this photograph of her um, amongst many others that are just haunting. And they were um, I had never seen them my entire life. Um, I spent my childhood going to Jack London State Park and. It's where I discovered I was a writer, um, but I'd never seen these photographs until I was doing research on writing her life. And, um, and so it was so amazing to see an older Charmian um, and, and an older Charmian that was happy with who she was and clearly um, comfortable with herself. Um, these photos really show her personality. And so um, this poem is about that poem, that um, this photograph right here. It's called Smiling into the Ruins of Wolf House. And that's where she's standing. She's standing in front of the ruins of the mansion that they never got to move into. Smiling into the Ruins of Wolf House. There are the tall trees that blaze in the night, hungry rockets of blue fire. Then there is the smoke that lingers like a question for years to come. What's left after the great fire or stones, still blackened and stacked, murmuring moss. When the photographers come to the ranch, he's been dead 30 years. Charmian stands tall in the doorway where once they had imagined a door, wearing a sweater the color of sky. She is smiling at the camera. She is surrounded by the ruins. You won't know this photo. This isn't the understory that was left to survive under the forest that's grown up around this ruin. It isn't written on placards at the state park. It has been buried in the innards of a cement building. Still, there she is at the threshold, not a door, something more, something that seeds us as we pass. Very, very descriptive. That must have been a terrible heartbreak for them. Yeah, it was. Um, it was really awful. In fact, it was something Jack didn't recover from very well. Um, he was definitely, they, they put all their money into it as well. So, so it was how, really- How did the fire start? 
Um, it was actually, they did a forensic study. Well, what Jack and Charmian thought is that it was or arson during their lifetimes. But in the 80s, they did a forensic study and found out it was actually the linseed oil that they used um, to, they were finishing the floors and they left the rags um, with the linseed oil right next to the house. And Glen Ellen gets really hot in the summers and it was over a hundred degrees. And so they, they combusted, they, you know, they just went, they just broke into flame and that caused the destruction um, of the house. It was, yeah, it was very devastating. Um, so one thing about Charmian is that um, after Jack died, she had an affair with Harry Houdini. I don't know if you guys know that, um, but it's probably, it was probably the most famous thing about Charmian besides the fact that she's Jack London's wife. It's always, she was, she's always identified with these famous men. Um, and so that was a real area of interest for me when I was researching her biography, because I thought, um, well, that's strange that she would go from one really intense man to another, you know, cause Harry Houdini obviously liked to be in front of a crowd, right? And Jack London was a really intense personality. And she had just, when he died, she actually, was relieved in some way. I mean, she was very sad to lose him, but she was relieved to be able to have her life back in some ways. And so um, I researched her affair with Harry Houdini and it turns out it only lasted a few weeks. Um, and she she called it off uh, because, I mean, she did call him her magic lover in her diary, which was, you know, too good to be true. It was such a great quote to put in the book. But um, the the reality is that she broke up with him because he became immediately, you know, he was married, A, and he was really obsessed with her. And, and he was kind of blurring that line, like he was wanting her to follow him and follow his lead. And, and she was like, no, 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 now I'm gonna be me, you know? And so that's what this poem is about. It's called The Water Cell Escape, and it's after the famous water cell escape that Houdini was famous for. <clears throat> <clears throat> That the heart is not shaped like a trick box, though velvet tongued, though bottomed with a spring loaded door that opens when pressed hard enough. That one can feel field in that smooth fogged glass. The night she met Houdini, the crowds of hundreds hush as they watched his daring escape. That the chains were heavy and marked the skin, and the two and two of the extras disappeared. First, her sickened husband, then Houdini's young wife. That the heart is not shaped like a trick box, letters folded into tiny stars up against the milk star sky of a clear night. That you have to fold your body just right. The week she spent in New York like chambers of an ever turning nautilus shell. That the water was cold, that it rose fast, that always at the center of the shell, there was nothing solid to hang on to. That underwater, everything looks and sounds like a dream. Hair blooms, chains loosen. That the heart is not shaped like a trick box. And one can walk off that dark stage alone to nothing but the custody of stars. Beautiful, as someone said, you have such beautiful imagery. You can Thank just you. visualize it. Thank you so and much. And I, I think we're such a small group. If any of the attendees want to make a comment, please, please do so. Yes, please. I'd love to hear your comment. So this is going to be my last Charmian um, poem before I read a couple from the other parts of the book. Um, this is called um, House Empty Speaks a Loud Truth. And it's actually... Um, it's about the House of Happy Walls, which you can see in this photograph. And uh, I made this slide so you can read along with me if you'd like. Um, it's a really funny looking sonnet. Um, and it's about the time I got to go into the House of Happy Walls, which is the museum at the park. It's also, it was Charmian's house she built after Jack died. It was her dream house. And um, she was kind of erased from it in um, the 80s, 90s, when I would first visit the park. She wasn't there. Their, their only living daughter that died shortly after birth, Joy Baby, was not represented. All of Charmian's life was not really in there. And so much of her um, had been erased that um, it was a big deal when I got to, as a biographer, 
I got to go into the house where she lived and they didn't watch me. And so I got to do whatever I wanted. And I like snuck in everywhere. Don't tell them, but I totally did. So this is called House Empty Speaks Loud a Truth, 2018. House made of breath exhaled from wooden ribs. Two, Dale Carnegie's name scribbled on a cream closet door. Three, a nautilus shell eating a light bulb sheds the softest light. Four, calabashes painted gray sway from their ropes whenever the earth shakes. Someone tried to mute their color. Five, she designed the house so that it would never burn. Six, the rock patio has a pyramid shaped staircase that leads up and over the edge. Seven, left unattended, I slid every window latch open, shimmied through sliding doors. Eight, you could hear the red breasted robin singing from the second floor. Nine, the silver painted wallpaper came off on my fingertips. 10, what they thought was a guest room was actually her office. 11, when the state cataloged the house, everyone forgot she was a writer. 12, it never burned. 13, bays and oaks move closer to the house. Hear their leaves whisper. 14, Though they'll cover the fountain in the sun-filled dining room, its waters will keep broadcasting to future vi visitors. All right, well, the second box is, I'm gonna open it up a little bit for you guys. And this is called Autobiography. And what it does, the second box of the book is about um, during the, in 2017, I lost my mother. Um, to ovarian cancer and I was her caregiver and at the same time we had the devastating fires of 2017 in Santa Rosa um, and so it was a really intense time in my life um, and a time when I realized how much our community needed poetry um, and this poem that I'm going to read to you it's called directions after the firestorms 2017 and um, I'm going to go to the other slide so you can see it there um, and the, um, the poem, the model of it is um, a poem where you write five directions to your home. And we wrote these in the community as a way for people to heal from losing their actual homes in the fires. And a lot of kids wrote these poems. Um, it was a really powerful thing. So this is called Directions Home After the Firestorms. One, follow the ash heaps, the hills arching their black skin. History hums like a refrigerator underneath. You should have listened, listened. Two, these days the sky, bruised cloud sky opens obscenely. Look closely enough and you can see up her skirt. Three, look for the door in the mountain, steel tooth sealed with wax. Four, they say spring in all her glory, they say the quick and the dead. They say bright green stitches will rewrite this landscape. Will we know it? Five, dump trucks heavy with debris, hawk circle catching thermals, a drone humming on the horizon, on the horizon, taking pictures of the dead. Six, will I always be afraid of a warm wind? So the next poem I want to read um, kind of takes us into the area of where I'm going now with my research. So my um, my grandmother um, came over during the Dust Bowl. Um, and when I was growing up, I was in high school, I, I read The Grapes of Wrath. And I'm so excited. I went to my grandma after school and I was like, Grandma, you'll never believe it. They wrote a book about us. It's called Grapes of Wrath. It's so awesome. And she was like, that is the worst book I've ever read. She's like, it is not true. And I, I was like, you're just grumpy grandma. But it turns out my grandma was completely right. Um, Steinbeck's book is not set where the Dust Bowl took place. And a lot of the information he got, he actually 
took from uh, a woman named Sonora Babb, who was an amazing writer who um, had a contract with Random House to publish her book, whose names are unknown um, about the Dust Bowl. That was, um, the contract was ended uh, just weeks before she was supposed to put it out because of the success of The Grapes of Wrath. Um, and currently I'm writing her biography. So full disclosure, I'm completely invested in her life. But as a way, you know, I talked about my process of writing poetry to get to biography as a way to get to Sonora Bab, I'm doing an erasure poem of The Grapes of Wrath. And so that means that I'm going through the pages of The Grapes of Wrath and circling letters and words to spell out my own poems about my grandmother and about Sonora Bab and about our heritage in the San Joaquin Valley um, as a way to kind of speak back to the book and kind of embolden it, embolden myself to write um, uh, Sonora Bab's um, biography, which hopefully will be out in the next couple of years. So this one is about my Oki heritage. And I say the word Oki with love and respect. Um, it's called Communion of Dust. And it was once made into a song. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I did a residency with a, a choir and someone wrote a song from this poem. Communion of Dust. It's how I arrived in this place. Dust, blood, Thin figures, shadows stretched like bars against a farm gone fallow, gone dust, gone wind. My grandmother said Steinbeck never got it right. The place, the leaving, and how it felt to be a child in a world gone back to dust. She'd breathe the dust into me some birthdays or when I'd come back to visit from college until the dust stuck to my tongue clouded my eyes as I tried to drift farther and farther away. She whispered into my ear the songs she'd sung in the canneries, the long hours she worked as a child until the land had become me. No way to escape the need to carry it, to tell it. And I'm gonna read um, one more from this central um, I'm going to read two more poems, you guys. Uh, this one is from the middle section, the autobiography section. Again, my grandmother will be speaking in this poem, um, as will my mother a little bit. But it's about an actual sinkhole we had in our driveway. I live in a very rural part of Northern California, um, and we have a long driveway um, that's made of um, gravel. And when, whenever there's a rainstorm, rarely, but when there is, it washes out all the gravel and a couple of years ago, we had a sinkhole, which means the middle of the driveway just opened up into a huge hole and we couldn't get through. And it, it kind of revealed a lot of the history of the driveway in this place, which is an old apple farm in um, Northern California. And it brought back the history of my ancestors. This is called sinkhole. Driveway washed out. We are done drifting from place to blown place. A silver boat lies like a question on the side of the road. River keeps rising. It is our heritage to continue through. Dust storm, drought, fire, flood, mudslide, earthquake. The woods around our house lean in, listening for what the seasons have to offer up. When you reroute a river, restitch a seam, something breaks. My grandmother sat close as her radio spit hate. Even a small spark can ignite. When you live this close to a river, this close to the woods, this close to a fault line, better know your way out fast. How will I pack all of her hate? Once saw a river stitched into the ceiling, blue and silver sequins snaking across as if change could be caught. This time we will dig out. Our mouths will be dry, stuffed with feathers. Second time the rain washed our driveway out, the red brick teeth of the road were revealed. Is this my inheritance? Owls don't come out in rain, so the sound of our sentinel is gone. Red brick cemented together under three feet of river rock we shoveled on. Once the previous inhabitants came back to sit 
with a stone jawed creek. They never revealed their source or why they'd hidden statues of Greek goddesses in the walls. My grandmother could be a low morning fog that clings to the trembling redwoods, or she could be the minerals beneath the soil that stubbornly hold this whole thing down. Now that the owls have gone mute, now that all we built is washing away gravel, mud, the weight of what, what we've been collecting, my tongue has gone heavy, too many stones washing down. Now that the skeleton, blood red brick, bricks, has shown its form are underneath, the rain will keep coming. Whether we live or die, we will hold our story down. So I'm going to end with a poem from the last section, which is called, um, it's, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's called recorded history. And it's a, it's a way of challenging the idea of the West. Uh, but this is one of the happier poems in it. And it made me think of today because I live, like I said, on an apple, uh, on an apple, um, old apple farm. And these hundred year old trees have broken into blossom today. And it's just beautiful. So, and it's a sunny day. So I thought I would share Daphne's broken sonnet. You've been a lovely small crowd and it's been, I hope you're thinking of some questions to ask me. Um, so here it is, Daphne's broken sonnet. Apples are imagining themselves into the hill, onto the hillsides. Pink petals stick out their tongues from the dark mouths of branches and the forest can canopy ripens overnight until it pulses like a green heart. Spring Frankensteins all, spring Frankensteins us all, softens our cyborg brains. Admit it, you were thinking about what mysteries your phone will sing out. While your body turns like a tree toward the light. Reader, some days it's just too much. Powder blue sky, light wind stirring the leaves as if they are waving, no, beckoning me to root and join in. How could I not give in trying to find the song that's buried in the soil? Thank you guys. Oh, thank you very much, Iris. Beautiful, beautiful poems. And um, how wonderful and special to have two such strong women in your life. Your, your, <laughs> mother, your mother and your grandmother that you were very close with and um, can have such memories to be able to um, write these poems with Thank as you. someone says just beautiful imagery imagery um with your writing so thank, thank you. you very much so um you when you're seven or when you're in seventh or eighth grade you went first time to the jack london park Is that sixth correct? grade sixth grade was the first time i went there um on a field trip and so you um it just inspired you to start to write or yeah, to write poems or was there a program that day or just um, you just finally found what you enjoyed doing? Well, I had always been a writer. I didn't really pay attention in school and all I did was write stories, but I didn't know that you could do that for a job. So um, there weren't like poets in the schools or writers in the schools when I was younger and I went to a really rural school. And so we went on this field trip and I, I met Jack London and I was like, Oh, wow. oh my gosh, you can travel the world and write about it. Sign me up, you know? So um, I just, it kind of normalized what I was and um, it really connected me to Jack Lennon's story. And I, I didn't know that I met Charmian that same day because she wasn't, you know, she, her, her being a writer wasn't actually depicted there. So that was pretty amazing. Excuse me. So I hope you got a book signed by him. No, no, he didn't. He was long dead by the time I got there. Oh, well, you said you okay, you had met him that day. So I No, I met him. I met him in the exhibit. Fictionally. Fictionally. Yeah. Fictionally, yes. I, I but visualizing that thinking that um, that would have been a very special thing to have done because um when did he die in the nineteen sixteen? Yeah. He died in nineteen sixteen and Charmian died in nineteen fifty five. So it would have been more likely that I would have met her, but it was in the it was in the eighties, so she'd been long dead. So you, you felt 
of their presence when you went there that day. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely did. I still go back there quite often as a way to reconnect with um, myself as a writer, especially now that, you know, I've told Charmian's story. So I feel even more connected. Right. And so um, you're now working on your next book and you discovered that um, by realizing that nothing had really been written about her. Yeah, so there was no biography yet about Sonora Bab. Um, and she's actually featured in um, uh, Ken Burns' uh, Dust Bowl documentary. And um, so I had I'd watched that and saw this whole segment on her. And so I started reading her books and uh, she's just an amazing writer. And the way she writes about the West, you know, women have agency and it looks like the West that we know, like we, that's multicultural and diverse. And, um, you know, women actually played a part in all these things where they were erased. And so um, I immediately connected with her writing. Um, and then when I found out about her story and I remembered my grandma's reaction to the Grapes of Wrath, I was like, oh, this was meant to be. So I started working on it about a year and a half ago. And um, I'm about five chapters in, so. So you said that um, she was married to a producer in Los Angeles and actually lived in Los Angeles? She was married to a cinematographer, um, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Howe, so James, James Howe. Um, and they uh, lived in Hollywood, um, in Hollywood Hills. Um, and she, they actually ran a, um, a Chinese restaurant for in the 40s in um, Hollywood. Um, and, but he was really famous. He got Academy Awards famous. Um, he was known for how he could capture light. And so all the actors, especially before, um, before, you know, when it, when it was, uh, black and white, um, there's something that's like, like a blonde haired woman with pale eyes would look really strange. And he was able to change the filters on the camera to make them look who they were, how they looked in their, in real life. And, um, so all of the famous actresses wanted Jimmy to, to film them. And he really established himself that way. Oh, fascinating. So she and, was married to these. Um, yeah, she was married to him. She was also friends with like Ray Bradbury. She was in a writing group with Ray Bradbury for um, 30 plus years. Um, she was friends with, um, she had an affair with Ralph Ellison. Um, so she's amazing to follow her life it's it's really fascinating so it says it takes you about seven years to write a biography well this one won't take as long because it's not my first one um i had i came into it with more of a plan um and i would say i'm going to finish writing a draft of it by the end of the year so, that's so the plan you, and you have your publisher will it be the same one that's published your books well, they're interested in it, but right now I have an agent that's um, looking into some other opportunities, but it's possible that it'll be with them because they did publish all of um, all of uh, Sonora Babs books. So yeah, so they would want to have it. Or, yeah, they're really interested. Yeah. Just exciting. It's exciting to have people interested. <laughs> oh, yes, it is very much so people that are anxious to read it and, and you're exploring new things. So where are you going? You're going to the Huntington Library because she's uh, here, or do they have it? No, any? actually, her collections are in Texas at the uh, Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. So I've been there about six times so far. Um, I'll probably be going there once a month as I work on this project. So how did they end up at um, University of Texas in Austin? Um, she was so towards the end of her life. She connected with these different. Um, scholars and this one um, named uh, Doug Wixon. Um, he was he worked there at University of Texas at Austin, and so he made arrangements for her papers to be housed there. The Huntington wasn't had like they weren't interested in her papers at the time. Um, they were you know a little more old school back in the back in the day. <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so now, now they would have just jumped at the chance. They would, yeah. I mean, now they're smart enough to have Octavia Butler, so, you know. Right, yes. <laughs> Who I would love to write a biography on. She's amazing. Yes, absolutely amazing. Well, she was uh, 
one of our ones in the one story office, Octavia Butler, and it was unfortunate. Um, she died just before she was going to come and speak at the library. Oh, no, really? So we uh, found somebody that knew her very well, and we did the program that way. That's our only out of this. This was our 20th year. Um, so it, out of all 20, that's the only one that was unfortunate not been able to attend due to wow. very surprised death. So, um, so um, somebody says it was wonderful to hear Charmaine's story. We celebrated Jack London, the myth and maverick as part of the big read at the Pasadena Public Library in 2008. Awesome, yeah. Well, I hope you read Charmaine's story. Yeah, so someone wants to know how much of the fires affected your family? Well, um, we were lucky not to lose our home. Um, we were evacuated. So, you know, there's been a lot of fires up here. It's just like you guys have had a lot of fires. Um, the first fire, we were not evacuated, but we housed all of our friends because we live on, you know, in the country and there was space. So everyone had like 10 people living with them who were evacuated and then everyone just moved based on the evacuations changing because it went on for two weeks uncontained. Um, but then the second fire, we were evacuated, the second big fire. And um, so I had my kid, we had a kid sleeping over. So we had me and my husband and my two boys who are teenagers and their giant teenage friend and our three dogs and my dad and my aunt all in, all in a line trying to get out. And there's ash raining down and there's sheriffs you know, like trying to get you to, it was very dramatic. And we, you know, you forget everything important when you evacuate, even if you have a go bag, you forget what you need. So it was, that was probably the biggest one. But your home withstood all of that. But our home withstood it. Yeah, no, we were really lucky, very fortunate to not lose our home. A lot of my friends lost their homes. Did you clear the brush around it or did your apple trees, but you, you lived in an apple tree. You had lots we do, we live on the edge of a forest. So if the fire comes here, our home is gone. It's just, there's no way to clear the trees because they're right, they're right out. You can probably see some out the window. They're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. like a field with apple trees and then there's a forest, so. Oh, I bet it's absolutely beautiful. And it's really pretty, yeah. Now would be lovely. A lot of birds, all the birds. So the owls increased after the fires. There were like hundreds of owls that came to live in our area because of all the damage to the forests all over Sonoma County. And so we have like all these owls that still live here that are always talking. They're always trying to talk to their mates all night long. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh. So they're in like oh. all of my poems. Like there's owls everywhere in these poems. Yeah, so you just close your windows and now you can't hear them anymore. Yeah. You've heard them so much that you just kind of tune them out. Yeah, I, I like hearing them. Just like the hawks. We live on a hill called Hawk Hill as well. So there's every day the hawks are riding the thermals and screaming and it's really, I love it. Oh. I spent a lot of time with the birds during COVID. So <laughs> quite, a, quite a symphony you have. I did. And they, they <laughs> increase when there's less human noise, there's more bird noise. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so you're out there talking with them too. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're not talking to, I mean, I had teenagers and <laughs> it was soothing. <laughs> oh, no. Are there, are there people in your family that are writers or poets as well? No, no. They are, they don't want me to talk about my subjects anymore. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, that's a shame. So it's a good thing you do these programs. And yes, no, my, my son is going to Utah, um, Utah, uh, University of Utah, and that's where Charmian's uh, father was stationed. Um, and so, and then, I mean, she wrote all about Salt Lake City. And so when, when we went there, I was like, oh, and he's like, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty well, funny. Often happens. Yes. They're very proud of everything that you do, but then <laughs> they, they've heard so much of it too. They just don't want to hear it anymore. Yes. <laughs> well, but they're still very, very proud of you. And you should be very proud of everything that you've done. So, um, well, it's been lovely speaking with you. Your poems are absolutely beautiful. 
So thank, thank you. you so much. Your words and your reflections, and they kind of very much draw you in and stay with you. So thank you, thank you so much for spending an afternoon with us. We've enjoyed that very much. And part of the 25th anniversary of National Poetry Month. Yay. So, yeah, yeah, it's quite wonderful. It really is. And so thank you for being a part of it very, very much. And we'll thank you. We have your book on order. And as soon as we have it, everybody will get to enjoy it. So, and wow. then also everybody can get a copy of the book at Robert's Bookstore. Uh, that's our local Pasadena bookstore. So you can please purchase a copy from them. And remember that this um, program is on YouTube Pasadena Library. It's recorded to the cloud. So thank you very much for allowing us to do that, um, Iris. And it will be pulled down eventually from the cloud and posted. Right. Well, thank okay. you so much. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.